I just bring you all to order. Uh, this is my first time doing this, um, so I don't know what you're expecting, but I'm only capable of doing what I can do. Uh, so I am going to give you um, a brief, and I am open to questions afterwards, so don't, don't expect a complete state of the nation or a layout of the precise program of work uh, for SFI um, over, the last, over the next uh, year or so, but perhaps a broader um, sense of actually the spirit of the conversations that we had yesterday. I think we had a, a really great discussion um, uh, yesterday through the panel discussions, through the keynotes and through the feedback from the floor. Um, and maybe just to kind of at a high level and kind of outline the spirit of where we might go, acknowledging the fact that there is going to be, understandably and appropriately, and I'm really looking forward to it, great change um, over the next two years um, under the government's new strategy that our colleagues from uh, the Department of Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science were good enough to come and talk through with us uh, yesterday and receive your feedback. The amalgamation of the agencies and uh, the feedback that we had from the public on that very useful project, uh, Creating Our Future. So that's the, that's the structure, and I'll speak for about 20 minutes, I hope. Um, I, I was thinking of giving you a short, I was so inspired by yesterday's science that I was thinking of giving you a short kind of history of my own engagement with science, but I took that out in the interest of time, and we'll, 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 you can hear my scientific biography on another occasion. So this is the structure. I just want to start with an expression of gratitude. Then I want to come to the conversations that we had yesterday and what I took from them. Talk briefly about Impact 2030 and, to, and creating our future. More what I'm taking from them in my leadership of Science Foundation Ireland. And then talk a little bit about the opportunity of the new agency at a very high level. And I want to talk a little bit about my personal view um, of the advantages of the arts, humanities, social sciences, science, engineering, mathematics, and technology coming together in, in one entity. Um, and I'll honestly, without calling anybody out, uh, be really drawing deeply on my experience of leadership in Maynooth, where that was the reality uh, of daily life for us. And it was a privilege to be part of that community for 10 years, where those disciplines seemed to interact in a more fluid way than I had ever experienced before. So, can I start with the expression of gratitude? And I say this really, really uh, honestly and, and very much from the heart. I want to express gratitude to two groups of people. The first is, is my colleagues within SFI. And I need to say this, so I'm new to the agency. I come into the agency from outside. And I need to say this to the community because the community has acknowledged frequently to me what I've observed for myself, which is the extraordinary professionalism, experience, commitment, agility uh, of colleagues at all levels in SFI, not just expressed, and I'll thank them formally uh, later in the morning for the event that we've just had. Uh, but over the last 10 months, it's been a privilege to get to know and work with uh, colleagues in SFI and to recognize what they're, as, as um, staff of the funding agency, contributing to the system uh, to understand just what that's based on, that really deep experience, uh, that really uh, profound professionalism. And of course, for each and every one of them, their own uh, inspiring journey in science or engineering or technology or policy that enables them uh, to work with me uh, and with the board um, in a funding agency to meet the needs of the community, and from time to time, and appropriately so, to hold a mirror up to the community and say, we can do better, or in areas such as EDI or, or open research, for example, we must do better. So I really do want to say that, and I really mean it, and I want my own staff to know uh, that you said that to me privately about them as individuals and them as a collective, and I, I really am grateful to them for their support. Uh, not, well, actually, not just for their support, but what they've done over, over the 20 years of SFI and, and for their support uh, in the last year. And then equally gratitude to the community. So over the last uh, day, we celebrated your work. Uh, that work is outstanding. Um, I don't use the word, word world class much because it's somewhat debased, but it is genuinely world class work. You can stand it up alongside the work of colleagues worldwide, and it stands up with it, 
and against it. Uh, and you kept that going through some very difficult times. And by difficult times, I mean the last decade, the time since the global financial crisis, where the, the, there was a shift in, of necessity in how research was funded and what was expected of you in a community. And then equally, of course, through the last two years, and not only keeping the research uh, going at that high level, but many of you then pivoting on the basis of talent, experience and investment uh, to assist us in the management of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, I want to express those two things because I'll never have an opportunity to do it in the same way again. To move on then to our conversation of yesterday, I found the synthesis of all the conversations of yesterday really quite inspiring. Um, you'll have heard my views on some of these things before. But I think what came across very clearly from the keynotes through the panel discussion and exploration um, of what came up during the day, this very strong sense that we all share of the almost equal importance of fundamental applied and engaged research, and recognizing that they bear fruit on different timescales, but they all bear fruit. And the most fundamental research, uh, quite frequently and unexpectedly, over a time span of decades um, uh, becomes an application uh, or an insight uh, for, for future development. But equally, of course, fundamental research bears fruit on the very short time scale of the talent that it attracts um, and the training that it provides. And there, there's nothing more important, in my view, uh, than the rigor uh, and agility conferred <clears throat> on a colleague new to the profession by a training in the fundamentals of their discipline and by exposure to work at the frontiers of their discipline. And that brings me to the second point, that we can worry, um, <clears throat> we can worry about how do we invest in fundamental research. And my view is we shouldn't worry. If we think about it as investing in talent, and investing in, in talent working at the frontiers. One of the great correctives is nobody wants to waste their time. And the people best placed to understand where is the next region to explore at the part of the frontier that they occupy is the investigator themselves. And they're not going to waste their time looking at questions or addressing problems that are likely to be trivial, are likely to be less than useful. They're going to address their time and energy to addressing the problems that they can see at the frontier that they think are most likely to bear fruit and most likely to be relevant. So I think that's the second key theme that arises out of yesterday's conversation and <clears throat> will inform our strategy going forward and already does, is that what we're really about at the fundamentals is investing in people, working at the frontiers, trusting them to be asking the right questions, and I'll come back to that in a minute, and that creates over the long term, the foundation for applied and engaged research. And I think there's a, re there's a necessity for renewal here. The last 10 to 15 years of our enormous success in engaged research, in working in partnership with others uh, to yield results for the environment, for society and the economy, is built on decades of prior investment in talent that could then apply themselves to those tasks. And as we look forward to 2030 and 2040, over the next few years, we need to make sure that we continue now to invest in talent and fundamentals so we will have that talent and that capacity and that agility when fresh um, uh, applied challenges face us. And I was really struck yesterday by something which is very dear to my heart. I was an interdisciplinary researcher. I, had to, I, I came to science with the language of electronics as well as the language of biology. I could kind of speak, kind of pigeon electronics, if I can put it that way. Uh, so I learned the basics of the language and that allowed me to do a whole area of research that otherwise I, I simply couldn't have engaged in. And I was very taken by uh, Andrew Keane's comment about the overhead of interdisciplinarity. It takes time and effort and investment uh, to be truly interdisciplinary. Um, and we need to remember as an agency that we need to invest. We need to essentially cover that overhead uh, and support people um, in doing interdisciplinary research because it's uniquely challenging and uniquely fruitful. And we do, I should say, uh, and very much through 
um, uh, the research centres in particular, but not exclusively, um, or the strategic partnership that we're, that we're funding that, that Andrew's the lead on, uh, very heavily invest in, in interdisciplinary research because we have the disciplinary talent that we can invest in. And I was also very struck by the power of engagement and the power of challenge-based uh, research to think again about how we do research, think about how we can accelerate research in particular areas because people want us to, uh, because the people that are funding us need us to accelerate research in certain areas. And, and by Derek O'Keefe's comment, which we've heard on many occasions but needs to be um, brought out more widely, in his case, the necessity of starting with the patient and more generally than for us, the necessity of starting with people uh, in general. Uh, I often say citizen, but I got to remember that not everybody we care about is a citizen. So the, the, the importance of starting with people and their problems, not in everything we do, and it doesn't contradict what I said earlier about also looking at the frontier of knowledge and what do we need to do there, but starting with people and their problems. And um, from Professor uh, Uchegbu, um, I think a really crystalline point. I think, I think th those keynotes and those panels brought us to the point of realizing maybe we are not engaged with people and the public as much as we should be. And maybe we're not humble enough in those engagements. Uh, so these are not really my words, these are a synthesis of what other people had to say yesterday. The truth is, and I, I have to say, I find this with, with politicians, I find this with public servants, and I find this with people. People care about research as much as we do. They really do. They're as curious as we are. We got the wow moment yesterday when we saw those uh, images from the uh, James Webb telescope, everybody reacts to that in the same way because we are all human and we all share the same concerns. So I, I may be foolish in this, um, uh, but I fundamentally believe that an honest conversation with people, with the political system, with each other, about what are our real objectives in research, from advancing knowledge right out to uh, providing real solutions to people with healthcare needs, uh, to biodiversity loss, to the climate crisis, an honest conversation about these are the things that we want to do. And our solutions are not going to be perfect. Our solutions are not necessarily going to be quick enough. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to get things wrong. So an honest conversation about what uh, research brings to the system um, is, is vital, I think, to winning long-term public and political support. And that's why I'm such a fan of the Creating Our future initiative. That was an honest conversation. It was a genuine listening. And it's important that we, we, we maintain that. So I think it's important then to engage early and to en engage then with humility. Um, uh, your view is as important as ours now when it comes to defining the problems. Uh, and we need to have a conversation where we correct each other gently uh, all the time. We need to approach that conversation with diversity. People need to see the diversity of the community we have and we need to work on the diversity. And it also needs to be approached with confidence. Um, that's actually the big barrier. It's look, I'm comfortable here in my lab or my office or wherever it is, uh, getting out and talking to people is challenging. And then as a consequence, we, we not need not just to be representative of, but we actually need to be part of the community we serve. We don't need to see ourselves as something that stands apart and, and needs to be, for equity or equality reasons, representative. Uh, we need to be really part of the community. Um, and that gives us pause for thought on issues around access, uh, uh, actually getting in to the profession and getting into what the profession knows about and discovers, so linking to, to open access and open science, as well as inclusion, and we'll achieve that through engagement. So that's why I like this strategy. Like, like every strategy is what you make of it. It's words on a page. You can embody it or instantiate it in different ways. But as I've said before, and um, so since please stick to your time, 16 minutes, fair enough. Um, uh, so uh, moving, moving quickly along, but to acknowledge that, you know, governments don't always hand you a strategy that you can buy into. Uh, so this, for me, as, as an academic, as, uh, as the leader of a funding agency, is a strategy I can buy into. I'm particularly taken by the first shift in emphasis. So I think, I think we're moving here from, from 
a, a sense where what the state felt it needed was there were issues around kind of expediency and capacity. You know, we, we need to rebuild an economy and we need to rebuild it quickly to issues around sustainability and depth. So the state is now taking a longer view and there's a huge shift there in saying our objectives in terms of impact are right across society, economy and environment. And we need to take those, those in the round and I would suggest it starts with the environment and we work back because all the others have to be sustainable within that planetary boundary. Um, and I'd like just to skip down to the fourth. Um, the focus on research talent for me is the transcendent thing. That's where we start uh, and that's, where we're going to, that's how we're going to enable all the other goals. The importance of investment um, and the importance also of skipping back up to there has been huge success in, the con in this country driven by this agency in terms of optimizing the engagement between the research community and enterprise and we can do more there but this strategy broadens it out to include e equally important uh, colleagues in the public services and a broader engagement with citizens and also in, in the fifth pillar uh, emphasizing the importance of extending our international connections again an area in which the agency has been successful. And um, I really am taken by this document and I'm taken by the fact that we were brought back to it yesterday, not by citizens, but by our own scientific colleagues who are saying there is complete homology between the things that concern us and the things that concern people. So I'll be bringing us back time and time again uh, to this list of 16 priorities or 16 themes through, formed through this excellent uh, piece of work which I found incredibly useful since, since I started and I really want to congratulate uh, my colleagues and colleagues in the department uh, for leading this work. And I'm not going to go through them uh, in detail but I am going to just remind you for a moment of the one on the top right, safeguarding public interest and trust in the digital world because I want to come back to a different perspective uh, on that, a kind of a non-scientific uh, perspective in a moment. So what do I see as um, the opportunity then presented by, again, put very nicely by our colleagues in the department yesterday, it's not all about the amalgamation, but this is a key enabling step to the vision um, of a holistic addressing of the societal challenges that I put up on the last slide. So we can look at this in a variety of ways. Uh, we can look at it kind of instrumentally, and these are the instrumental, really important strategic um, opportunities presented. It is an opportunity to place all research disciplines on an equal and statutory footing and to be equally inclusive and responsive and professional and rigorous in how we allocate funds across those disciplines. But it also gives us, and this is an opportunity not to be uh, trivialized, it's, it's non-trivial uh, to drive a step change in interdisciplinary research activity. And I'll just bring, it, bring you back to anybody who talked yesterday about interdisciplinary research. It is thrilling to do interdisciplinary research. It gives you new excitement, new insight, um, but it's difficult. So we have an opportunity here in a unified agency to really drive that and create links between disciplines uh, that simply don't exist. It also gives us, I think it was very welcome to hear from the department yesterday that the new thing, not the new agency as an agency, but the new portfolio needs to be bigger. Uh, so they are, they are saying we will invest more in research, but we want to invest in research which is holistic in this, in this manner. So it does give us an opportunity as we go through this transition to optimize the balance between fundamental, applied and engaged research. And you know we're doing that anyway. Um, you know, we're thinking about our portfolio and how do we make sure the balance between these, these three different components um, is optimized. You know, we're looking at the research centres with a view to building on that model, to achieving some consolidation across the system, to creating space for, for new joiners, but also, and very importantly, to ensure that we enable those research centres to operate right across uh, the technology research, uh, readiness levels to make sure that there is as much fundamental research going on in those centres as there is uh, applied. And, and truthfully, there is. Uh, we need to understand their portfolio better and then optimise it. 
I think it does give us the opportunity, bringing the two agencies together, to really focus on research talent and diversity and inclusion in that, in that research talent to achieve the aims that I outlined at the beginning. I think it offers us the opportunity to build these wider research partnerships, build on our experience, as I say, uh, in particular through the centres, in engaging with enterprise. Uh, I've said this in other four, but there was a really fascinating Institute of Physics report uh, out about four months ago on physics-based enterprises' engagement with academia. And one, several headline figures, but if you look across the numbers in that, the level of engagement in this jurisdiction is about twice the level of engagement in the UK. So for instance, about 17% of UK physics-based enterprises access infrastructure through the higher education system. It's about 35% in the Republic of Ireland. And that's because of the work that you and the, agencies have put, and the agency have put in to creating those connections, creating that infrastructure. And we need to build on that. We need to make sure that that is not nurtured and developed through the transition and extend it out to the public service and civil society. It gives us the opportunity to respond to the grand challenges and it gives us uh, the opportunity to strengthen public involvement and engagement in research. Now, I'm sure there's things I've left out of this, um, but broadly speaking, um, that's the kind of amalgamation that I would like to be part of and I, that I'll assist in driving. Um, and I do have to say right up front that this has to be a merger of equals in spirit. We're clearly not equal in size, we're clearly not equal in terms of the scale of the portfolio but we are equal in terms of our understanding um, of how the different disciplines that we're responsible for funding operate and how we can best support their development. So it has to be a question of taking the best of the cultures of the two agencies, um, recognizing the different successes of the two agencies, perhaps privately and reflectively reflecting on our weaknesses and uh, making something better out of the amalgamation and bigger, as, uh, as the department helpfully pointed out, out of the two. But I do think there's a, at a deeper level, uh, uh, there's more than that. And I think for this room, uh, one of the things that I would have to say is, I, I want us not to think about the humanities and social sciences as some kind of, and I'm not accusing you of anything, but I've heard it said, as some kind of useful adjunct to kind of the one true path of uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. These disciplines are ends in themselves. Uh, they're techniques and technologies of their own with their own very particular insights to how we are as people, to who we can be as a society, and yes, to how some of our scientific and technological solutions might actually work might actually be taken up and, and to working with us to identify problems. So I think we need to have a discussion within our higher education system and within our research funding about uh, the importance of, of these disciplines. And the important thing to remember is, it, back to the, the comment of yesterday, this is about learning different languages. And for many of these disciplines, the language is the technique and the language is, is, is vitally important. So that's why I'd like to close out. So I want to bring you back to that challenge around what people think about the security and privacy of data and so on. So here's, here's a poem. If Kieran Shoga can have a cat, I can have a poem. <laughs> um, this is a poem by Derek Mahan from his, and you might find this hard to read. Um, I mean this kind of grating to read, and I'm not sure saying I agree with the politics of this. But what Mahan is doing is he's, he's, he's sitting in his garret, he's sitting in an attic room in Fitzwilliam Square somewhere in Dublin looking out, and he's, he's starting off with the lone scholar. So beyond the backlit treetops of Fitzwilliam Square, a high window is showing one studious light. Somebody sitting late at a desk like me. So he's, he's setting up the picture of the scholar. There are some diehards still. How many of us have sat in our offices working away at a problem that we think nobody cares about and you feel there's some diehard sitting on the upper floors like me? A Byzantine privacy in Mews and Lane, but mostly now the famous Georgian Doors will house the junk film outfit or an advertising agency. The fountain's flute is silent though time spares, the old beaches with their echoes of cool domain. 
referring to Yates, foreign investment conspires against old decency, computer toast to computer, machine to answering machine. Those of you who remember answering machines, that is just a beautiful pun. Um, this, it's not just about privacy, security and trust. This is the unease that people feel with like the financialization. They can see that's really, it's not, this isn't just a swipe at the IDA. Foreign investment conspires against old decency. This is kind of an unease amongst people with the financialization, commodification of so many things. And then that beautiful line, the, the sense of loss of humanity, the deep concern here as computer to to computer and machine to answering machine. So this is an example of where our colleagues, a poet in this case, can express the really profound, inexpressed thoughts of people back to us and challenge us as people in leadership positions in technology to say, we need to address these things at this level. And at that point then, we can be assured, uh, because we, we know these things too, and we're concerned about these things too. Um, uh, but we, it gives us the opportunity to engage on this level. And then I want to just close out by, so what can interdisciplinarity really achieve? I want to close out, we were brought beautifully by that film, and movingly, I think, by the film prepared by colleagues in ICRAG to the Burren, and then in, in the panel, very ably chaired by Karen Shoga, Maureen Kennelly, was asked, how do we address those really grand challenges? That's the really tough things that we're actually, as a scientific community, frightened we're not going to be able to fix for the public, and the public are frightened they're not going to be fixable. And she talked about needing to blow our hearts open. Um, and either subconsciously or consciously, she was referring to the, the Seamus Heaney poem. Now, Jim Livesey told me that if I quoted Heaney, he was leaving, but I saw him leaving anyway. <laughs> so, so too late, uh, uh, because, because if the former director of Poetry Ireland can refer to Heaney, then so can I. Um, and because that's what I think the opportunity of a new agency and interdisciplinarity is. It's the last line of postscript. I love this version uh, because it demonstrates the poem having been published in the Irish Times, he edited it um, to improve it and almost changed that fabulous last line. So what happens in a truly interdisciplinary environment is the chance conversations, the, the buffeting of something that hits you sideways and catches the heart or the mind off guard and blows it open. So I think that's the real opportunity of interdisciplinarity. If we meet our colleagues across disciplines on a playing field where there is mutual respect and an interest in understanding, why do you think and work differently from me? You'll have those moments, and many of you have had them, where your mind is caught off guard and the problem is blown open. So without, that's it. Um, uh, that's where I think we're going, and fundamentally in that last line, that's why I think we're going there. Uh, and I'm really grateful for your support, and if we have time, I'm more than happy to take any questions uh, that you might have or that might have come in on Slido, if there are questions on Slido. Are there? No? No questions. Perfect. Grant? Oh, hold on, there is. Um, okay. Oh, there for the panel. Perfect. Oh, well, you can answer all those hard questions then, because I wouldn't dare to. Excellent. Very good. Thanks a million. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Philip. For people who don't know me, I'm Nora Lee Kennedy. I'm the Vice President for Research at the University of Limerick. And to colleagues who know me, if I'm sounding croaky, it's because of all the fantastic chatting and talking that went on last night and all the yesterday. So before I open the panel, I would just like to thank SFI and, and Philip particularly for the opportunity for all of us to come together at this wonderful summit. I mean, the buzz, the energy, the enthusiasm, the excitement, it's just fabulous to be back in a room together with colleagues and having these wonderful conversations. For those of you who also know me will know that I won't be quoting poetry or having any poems, but I would not want that to sound glib at all. Um, I think 
think we're in a very exciting time for research in Ireland. I think the opportunity that presents us through all that we heard about yesterday with the new agency, um, the new opportunities for interdisciplinary research, but at the bedrock of that, the opportunity to have that open, honest, respectful discussion about how we all work together, I think is really, really wonderful. I'm, I'm a health scientist by background. I've operated at many fringes and many frontiers, and I feel excited where, you know, before it might have been viewed that certain agencies were for certain types of researchers and not others. So I feel that that opportunity is very, very welcome. Come, and I'm very much looking forward to working with my VPR, VPDR colleagues and others in the department and also my colleagues in SFI and other agencies to have more of these respectful, open conversations about interdisciplinarity. Now, to get to these hard questions that Philip mentioned and seeing some of them there, I think our panel needs to start sweating it out a little bit, but no, they don't need to because they're a very able panel. Can I introduce Dr. Kiran Choiga, Deputy Director of SFI? These people need no introduction, but I'll do them anyway, just out of courtesy. Dr. Siobhan Roach, Director of Science for the Economy, SFI. Dr. Ruth Freeman, Director of Science for Economy. And also um, Mr. Donald Keane, Chief Operations Officer. So the idea of the panel this morning is that um, the colleagues are going to take an opportunity to just have some opening remarks. And I know they're all known to you and you probably know their portfolios and their briefs, but they wanted to take the opportunity to speak to you this morning a little bit about 2022, but also the future and particularly 2023. And we are going to keep the conversation a little more on the kind of high level rather than the nitty gritty, um, because you do you know, have opportunities through your contact points and others in SFI to get into some of those really specific right. questions about maybe an amount of funding or when a call is going to open. So I think given how Philip has opened the session, we might just keep it on that focus if that's okay with colleagues. Um, and I think I'm going to have to move Donal so I can look across <laughs> at the colleagues properly. Well uh, that team. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. So, you can all hear me all right there. I might start down with you, um, Kieran, if that's okay. If you just want to do your kind of opening comments, we'll move on then to Ruth, then on to Siobhan, and finish with Donal, and then we'll start with the tough questions. Grand. Actually, I was very pleased to see Donal sitting up there. I thought he was going to ask all the questions. <laughs> um, so, good morning, everybody. If, uh, if I am croaky, it's because I think we had three years of conversations to catch up on last night, and, and including the opportunity to sit beside Seamus and talk about quantum gravity waves last night. So, that was a, a lot of fun. Um, Look, so briefly talking about 2022, it's kind of hard to believe that it was four years ago that I first came around to talk to most of you about, you know, what is going to be the next strategy for SFI, going to all the universities and institutes of technology as they were at the time and had that conversation. And it then turned into, you know, sometime later, our strategy. Now, of course, the, the pandemic has slowed us down in many ways, but what would be good to talk about is we set a very ambitious strategy. You'd have heard the chair talking about it yesterday as well. We said there's, there's a lot of big things we're going to do. And they were big and they were hard and they were ambitious. And we're well underway. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things we've already achieved. And there's a lot more that I'm going to talk about for 2023 that we want to do next. But of the, the big achievements, some things we said, and there were some skeptics out there as well, because we've pushed the boundaries out. We said we're going to need to grow a lot of things. We're going to need the budget to deliver on these things, because that's what we heard loud and clear as we, as we had the conversations. We've also heard loud and clear about consistency and core programs and those as well. So they're all built in and enshrined. But on top of those things, if you think about the things we said, we said we would do that public level engagement at a scale that hadn't been seen before. And that was creating our future. You know, something on the largest scale in the history of the state in terms of public engagement on research. And we did that last year. Right? And we did that with you, with the department and with others. And that's kind of, you know, something big we said we would do. You'll hear from my colleagues just now. We said we wanted to really take challenges, challenge based funding to the next scale, to be the national agency for challenging. And that's kind of de facto happening at this stage. We said we wanted to do more in terms of north-south collaboration, and you'll hear Siobhan talk about it. We said we wanted to do hubs for regional hubs and investment in research and innovation at that sort of very sort of early stage translational research as well. And you'll hear us talk about that too. So we're starting to tick the box on each of these things. And if you look at our strategy and combine it all up, we basically needed, on top of our core budget, an extra 600 million over the next five years in the lifetime. That's not small, it's ambitious. But we're actually well underway with about 400 of all already identified coming down the pipeline of the six. We've got a line of sight for the rest of the 200 and beyond. And that only comes about if we're delivering really good work. Right? Because we take the work you've done, we go to Europe, we go to other places, and we say, look, it works. Right? This investment, it returns really interesting results, really interesting science, new knowledge, new solutions, new companies, whatever else it is, <clears throat> we make those cases. And that works, and it really has an impact. So 2022, and you know, since we launched the strategy, it's been a huge success. We've made huge strides forward, and there's a lot more to come. And in fact, we're just getting started. So there's a lot more for 2023 and beyond that we want to do. 
But the one caveat I'll put in there is what wasn't in the strategy is an amalgamation. Right? So we hadn't quite predicted that uh, as something we were going to do. And those are quite distracting. You know, there's things that you do in an amalgamation that will take time. It's a lot of work. If you've ever been involved in some of this, as I know a lot of you have been, um, these things are, you know, there's a change management element. So we could be get a bit distracted from that. Just to give you a flavor of some of the things we'd like to do in 2023 and beyond. And actually, just in some of the conversations yesterday, it kind of reminded me of where we're going and where those things are going to be. We know we've grown investment in certain areas, but what keeps us awake at night is growing investment in some of our core programs. That's a bit of a problem for us. Right? So that might be our frontiers programs, our pathway, it could be our, our research centers and other places. That's a challenge, right? and we know, we know we need to sort of turn our attention to that. We know as well, actually talking to Walter Kolsch last night, he reminded me as well on something else in the strategy. We need to be looking at how we can reduce the administrative burden in the system. Right? How do we get more time back into the system, not through extra costs, but actually by just taking out some things that have probably grown organically over the years, which is something we need to look at. There's another important aspect, which we all know about, which is we have to react to climate change. Right? We have to do something. Wouldn't it be fantastic if this time next year, we were sitting here and we had become the most sustainable research ecosystem in the world. Right? We set ourselves a goal that we're all going to be green labs and we're going to have a new award potentially for you know, the sustainability champion that we do award at the dinners the night before. Right? We have to set ourselves those you know, big ambitious targets to make a change and make it quickly. So those are the kind of things we'll look at next year. So we have big ambitions, lots of change we want to do. We want to continue our collaboration as well with other departments, agencies across the, the, the country and internationally as well. So we have worked on those in the last year. In fact, when we listened in the strategy, one of the things you guys said to us is collaboration across the system. And it didn't matter if you were an academic, if you were the public, if you were enterprise. Collaboration in Ireland is a, is a key for us because we're a small, interconnected nation. That is our secret sauce. And it's something we're going to continue to do. We've done in last year, and we're going to continue to do in the years ahead, which is continue to collaborate with other funders internationally, locally, and government agencies and departments, because that Team Ireland thing is something that makes a big difference. So there's a lot of really exciting, interesting initiatives coming down the track. Loads of areas for us to work on. Um, and as I said, we're just getting started. So you know, stick with us and it's going to be a hell of a ride. Great. Thank you very much, Kiran. Lots there to pick up on and we'll come to that in the questions. And we'll move on to you now, Ruth. Thanks very much, Norley. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I mean, we, we had a good opportunity yesterday to talk about challenge funding. So, so maybe I'll just start there. I mean, as Kiran said, that was a very important pillar in the strategy that we, we wanted to become the National Agency for Challenge Funding. As Philip said, kind of building on the, the deep expertise that's out there in the system. And, you know, I think also responding to the Creating Our Future initiative where, where we, we know, I mean, as Philip said, that the public are interested in all aspects of research, but, but they, you know, that engagement on challenges is a place where they definitely come to more easily. And, and it was, you know, something that we did want to bring forward um, the new National Challenge Fund has already launched. Um, we worked with the department to, to write a proposal to Europe to secure additional funding under the National Recovery and Resilience Programme. I think it's important to say it is additional. I mean, as Kieran said, it's not, it's not displacing our, our programmes that we already run. Um, and it will be an, a new investment of almost 70 million across the broad areas of digital, digital transformation and the green transition. Um, we already have run the first two calls. Uh, we had the panels for those last week, and we have four calls out at the moment. Um, we have made some changes to the programme, uh, which was broadly based on our Future Innovator Prize, um, following feedback from the community on how, how you all, I suppose, engaged with that programme. Um, so, so we're really hopeful that, it, that it, we will get lots of strong applications um, uh, so we, the Commission were visiting a couple of weeks ago um, to, to look at the overall implementation of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan in Ireland. Um, they engage mostly with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, who are the key leads on the programme. Um, but we did get the call to say they have decided to do a site visit just on one programme, and that's you. So I thought, well, that's, that's karma. Um, they came to visit us the, the Friday before Science Week. But, but I think, you know, they, they were so impressed with what they saw in terms of what had been delivered in the Future Innovator Prize. They were very much saying to us, this is the kind of work we want to invest in. And when we maybe come later to the discussion about how we collectively grow the budget for research, we'll need to think about those opportunities and, and how we, we get more funding from, from other sources apart from directly from the Exchequer. 
Um, so we, we hope there's lots of good applications. We need to find 90 teams in the broad challenge area in about the next sort of nine months. Um, so uh, you know, it's open for, for researchers at all levels to apply. Postdoctoral researchers can apply. Um, very experienced researchers can apply. And I think, as was mentioned yesterday, there's a lot of support from us as you go through those programs in terms of supporting you with training around stakeholder engagement, design thinking, uh, how you're going to tailor your, 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 your program and your solution. Um, so, so that's kind of where we are in terms of challenge funding. Um, we've just come out of Science Week and thank you to many of you who I know participated in events across the length and breadth of the country. Um, I was hearing great stories yesterday about lots of the um, really engaging activities that were happening everywhere, which was, which was great to hear. I mean, that's something that also remains a, as a critical part of, of of my everyday at the agency and, and, and for all of us. You know, we, we don't want creating our future to be the end of the conversation with the public about research. Um, and, and, you know, we're, so, so we're, you know, continuing to think about how do we have more meaningful two-way conversations where, where we, can, we can discuss these issues. Because when I think, as Philip said, you know, there's that balance where the public do feel that science has to come up with some big solutions over the next while, and there's a lot of trust in, in what we're doing. But I think we have, to, we have to go back and have the conversation about how, where, where science and technology is going to sit, and, and research now more broadly within the bigger issues um, that people are very concerned about. And so that's the work that we will be continuing. Um, Finally, just to come to our individual programs, the, the Frontiers of the Future program, the Pathway program, the Research Professorship programs. I mean, those are programs that we will continue to run every year. And I think it's just really important to reassure you of that. Um, they will sporadically close for a couple of weeks and then reopen again, and, you know, because we may need to just refresh the call documentation. Um, the awards are going to continue to remain open on a rolling call. The projects will be run on, on deadline calls. Um, just, just to share with you, I mean, something we've been thinking about, clearly we want to grow that pot. I mean, we understand as much as you do that initiatives like challenge funding or, you know, smart hubs or anything can only be built on strong foundations which come from those deep expertise. Um, I mean, one thing that has struck us is you know, the, the success rates in those programs are quite high at the moment. So uh, the success rate in the projects is about 28% at the moment, and the success rates in the awards is actually 61%. Um, so, so we're not getting huge number of applications. Um, and I suppose we're trying to understand how we bring those two narratives together. The narrative that, that people feel perhaps there isn't sufficient funding for individuals to do the frontier work, and on the other hand, you know, we, we feel like the success rates are probably beyond international best practice, certainly in the awards. And um, so that's certainly something we're interested in, in talking to you about so that we can understand that and maybe so that you can, you can see the opportunity that, that is there um, or, or give us feedback as to, as to why we're not seeing those applications. Um, so I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Ruth. I'm sure you could talk for much longer, but um, we can probably pick up some of those points, particularly about growing the, the ecosystem together um, in the Q&A. Um, I'll move on to you then, Siobhan. Great. Thanks, Norley. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. So I, I head up the Science for the Economy directorate within SFI, and the focus is very much around supporting collaboration between academia and industry and wider partnerships. And a big focus for us this year has been around the, the centre's programme, how that might evolve in the future, as well as developing new programmes. So if I touch first on, on the, the centre's programmes, I guess there's been two main strands that we've been focused on. The first is actually kind of, all of it is built on the fact that the model has been very successful to date. The program has been running since 2012 and because of all of the fantastic achievements that have been developed through it, other countries have been looking to Ireland to say, well, how do we develop such collaboration across the country in ways that you have been able to do? And part of that then has led to us being able to expand the model into new jurisdictions. So some of you may have uh, seen an announcement, I think it was about two weeks ago, about developing UK-Ireland centres, so co-centres. 
this is something that, that started a couple of years ago, an opportunity arose, and it was through kind of a political commitment in a power restoration agreement in the Northern Ireland Executive when they restored it a few years ago to establish all island research and innovation hubs. And it was really to build on all the excellent collaboration that has happened on the island of Ireland over a number of years and to be able to expand that. So at the time, we saw an opportunity to grow the budget pot. So this is funding that's coming, additional funding through our parent department, also through the Taoiseach Shared Island Fund. There was an opportunity to expand the model into Northern Ireland and into Great Britain. So it took a couple of years to, to get part of it over the line. So you'll have seen an announcement that there will be a call for centres, which will hopefully launch before the end of this week. And it's for centres in the area of climate and sustainable food systems. Originally, we did have a wider array of thematic areas that we were looking at, particular areas in the health space. They are with a, a different government department, so we're still focused on trying to get those over the line. But right now, we have a partnership with the Department for Agriculture and the Environment in Northern Ireland and UKRI. I'm very excited to, to launch those later this week, so we'll provide new opportunities for the system. The, the other part of, I guess, the future of centres is we're, we're going through a bit of a, a pivot point at the moment. So many of you will recall back in 2012 when the centres programme launched, we had previous CSETs and SRCs, and we then built on the successes of those models and launched the research centres model. Now we are, are looking at what should the future look like for the programme. So this started last year by bringing in an external panel of experts who evaluated the programme, met with various uh, stakeholders, some of you, you sitting here in, in the audience, and really they were blown away by the success of the model and they, the strong feedback for us was, you have a really unique model in Ireland. And now here are some ways you can expand and optimise and really strengthen that model for the country to deliver even greater impact. So what we've been doing and kind of working with you over the last year is really seeing, okay, how do we implement these in the future of the model? And it's about <coughs> simplification, optimization. So you'll have heard uh, Philip talk about consolidation of centres. So we're moving to a system where overall there will be less centres in the system. We see opportunities for synergies between different centres that currently exist to be exploited. We want to grow the excellence that already exists in the centres, introduce cohort-based PhD training, enhanced infrastructure. So it's really to absolutely grow and strengthen what's already there while maintaining very strong collaboration with enterprise, but also widening it to other stakeholders. And that comes back to the focus of the new agency around this wider interdisciplinarity and partnership approach. The duration of funding will be longer. We are looking to align back to national research priority areas. I, I'm aware this is causing a little bit of concern in the system, and we, we can talk about this a bit more. We have always had alignment with national priorities for the, the centres programme, so this is just main, maintaining that consistency. The other key point, I think, around it is we've been really conscious that we haven't been able to open up the programme to new entrants for a number of years. So we have to kind of, with a, a given budget pot that we have, look at, well, how do we continue to build on the excellence we already have and then recognise there are other opportunities that could be uh, suitable for centres in the future. So next year, before the end of the year, we will be opening up a call for centres that will be open to existing centres who look at the, the ambition of the new programme and reconfigure, and then new entities that, that haven't had funding uh, previously as a centre. Lastly, uh, quickly, the, the Smart Hubs is another programme that we are starting out in, in the new year. This is something that was an opportunity that arose through Ireland's National Smart Specialisation Strategy, which is funded through the EU. So we had, as Karen said, we had an objective in the strategy to set up research and innovation hubs to really accelerate the commercialization of early stage research. So what we are doing is going to develop these regional hubs that will be open to researchers across the island, uh, across the Republic of Ireland, to be able to access funding, to really work with experts in that particular domain from a very early stage in, in the concept and translate that research through continuity of funding 
we're trying to minimize bureaucracy. We, we've heard that come through uh, today in the conversations and really kind of bring on board what is needed from the very earliest stages to uh, translate that research and develop entrepreneurial researchers in the process and really streamline the process for funding flowing into Enterprise Ireland. So that is something that's still in development. We're still working with the system to fully shape that programme. But it is a new opportunity. It is earmarked funding. So again, this was something that had to align with the regional smart specialisation. It's not something where funding can be used for anything. It was a very specific pot of money. But I think it's a huge opportunity to tap into a gap that we have seen in the system right now. So I think I'll stop there. And, uh, oh, that's great. Over. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, lots in that. And hand over there to Donald. Hi, so, so I'm the Chief Operations Officer in SFI, so my, my areas of responsibility are it's grants management from the financial uh, control point of view, financial control in general, research policy, information systems, uh, and IT. Uh, obviously the fun end of SFI, you can see, like, in terms of what I have to do. Um, so I'll take you through just, you know, briefly some things that we, we cover in those areas, uh, and I'm representing, obviously, my, my, my colleagues in each of these today. So under the grants management, I mean, it's, it's fairly basic stuff. It's the, the issue of letters of offer, the managing of, of grant payments over the lifetime of, of your awards, uh, the changes processing that, that we do in terms of no cost extensions, budget reallocations, award transfers. So in terms of us informing ourselves about that, and this would be under Joan Hines and, and, and Elliot McVan, we, we also constantly engage with the research accountants and all of your institutions um, to be available to them to provide guidance when they have questions to make sure that everything is, is, is on the straight and narrow. <clears throat> and we have an annual workshop, we had it there about a month ago, where we kind of take feedback from them as to how we can improve in terms of what we do. Now on financial control, which would be under Joan Hines and, and Sarah Smithick, both are here, are here today. Um, I mean, I think our overall aim there is, is, is obviously a clean audit report. Um, when you get a clean audit report, it engenders like, like confidence in your operations, not just from the likes of the department, who, who obviously are funding us to the tune of 240, 50 million a year, but also from, from other <coughs> government departments that we partner with, uh, uh, DAFM, uh, uh, Foreign Affairs, etc., uh, and other research funding agencies. So we have collaborations with EPSRC, BVSRC, Wellcome Trust. Royal Society. So, you know, when you get a clean audit report, I mean, it gives the, those people the confidence that these are, are, are this is the body that, that they would want to actually partner with, and that's important. And um, on research policy, which is under Dr. Marion Boland and her team, that's one that probably impacts uh, a lot of you very directly. Um, some highlights in terms of the year we're in and also looking forward. Um, we did publish some guidelines in terms of the open access. Uh, to maximise the impact of the, the through no embargo type arrangements. Um, we've developed with Coalition S, which is, which is the, 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 you know, the European-based coalition on open access, uh, an impact survey, gathering data on, on publishing practices, <coughs> on experiences, etc. That's to assist in the future policy development. And still, as you know, open access is very much a work in, in progress. In terms of, of, of the, 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 what was gender, now it's obviously EDI. Um, we did recently publish in the last week or two our, our updated uh, gender dashboard. I think the last time was either, I think it was 2018 when we'd, we'd done it. And that covered uh, the SFI awards from 2011 right through to 2021. Um, I mean, the, 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 the dashboard, the updated one points, you know, from the last time to now, like some positive developments, um, Similar application success rates for women versus men, significant improvements in women in leadership roles across the portfolio. Some of those are obviously influenced by specific initiatives that we took in that particular space since, since 2018. So it was good to see some positive uh, results there. And we've completed a lot of our foundation work to do with the development of our new EDI uh, strategy, which we, we will be publishing in probably Q1 stroke Q2 of, of next year that replaces the current gender strategy, so say it is broader now. Uh, and we've consulted with, with, with a number of, of uh, relevant members of the community uh, who would have particular sort of angles on, on, on <coughs> diversity, inclusiveness, etc. Um, there's a workshop as well this afternoon, no, sorry, later this morning. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's oversubscribed, which is very gratifying to see, uh, and I'd recommend that to, to, to you. Um, uh, on the boring side, grant terms and conditions, we've updated and published those uh, recently. We 
following extensive consultation with the likes of IUA, TIA, etc. Uh, a long drawn out process, but hopefully we, we, we got there with a, a, a good result in the end. Um, in terms of terms and conditions, as part of that process, we also look at other terms and conditions, both, both uh, indigenous agencies and, and broader, the likes of UKRI. Uh, and, and no substantive differences have been noted. That some may be longer, some may be shorter. The language may be slightly different, but substantively there isn't really any, any great difference between them. So at least we're, we're, we, we kind of know we're on the right track. Um, we've now implemented data management plans. Uh, 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 and that's in the grant application process. Um, it's underpinned by, by obviously strong guidance that we give to applicants on that. And that ensures, if you like, stronger research governance overall. Um, currently, we have a, a, a pilot process we're engaged on in conjunction with the IOA to strengthen compliance in the whole state aid area. And, and many of you in the centres uh, will, will know about that whole side of things. So, so that. That is reaching a stage of, of conclusion in terms of the pilot and the learning. So we will be back to the, the IUA and to the people who participated just to, do, to, to bottom out some outstanding questions and to see where it's stating us, state, take us to. And the narrative CV format, uh, as espoused by, by the DORA principles, that, that's now been fully in, implemented in SFI's grant evaluation process. And, and Marion uh, Bowling Dictor has put an awful lot of work into that. Um, and we are also looking at the moment at the grant application budget policy, uh, and that's being updated. And there will be some enhancements and things like additional supports, for the likes of non-EU students, those in carer roles uh, and the like. Um, on information systems, uh, which is under Neil Dundon, uh, uh, um, that, that manages the grants management system, Sesame, which is one that we're, we're kind of all proud of. And we're consistently developing it, assisted by feedback. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, of um, the community. Um, we conducted a survey of research offices this year and the output's been worked through at the moment. Um, we also have a group of super users and they help us test initiatives. So all the time we are evolving this. Uh, and a noticed, notable development this year was, was an external dashboard which the centres use for reporting and Tableau. And that um, has been very successful. It's taken out a load of duplication and it's real time information available. And finally, IT under, under Eric, uh, that, all of our operations are obviously underpinned by that dedicated IT team. They support us in terms of our working, our office working, remote working, keep our data, your data safe uh, in a safe environment, and they provide technical solutions to support a more effective and efficient operation. So, that's my lot. Thank Great. You. Thanks very much, Donald. And, and lots in that, as you say, the bedrock really is important to be able to manage that, that, that huge volume of, of research funding. Can I just clarify with SFI, um, Donna, it's going on quarter past 10 the session, isn't it? Yeah, because your countdown timer says two minutes, mm. which I think uh, the panel might be delighted with, but the audience won't. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take, um, Ruth, might come to you first, um, and you mentioned particularly there the success uh, rates on two particular programmes, which I think might surprise us all. And then listening to what Philip mentioned earlier, uh, the key pillar in Impact 2030 on supporting all stages of career development. And what do you see from, you know, I suppose looking across both of those elements, I suppose the key challenges for a funding agency in supporting all stages of career development and what emphasis is maybe put at different stages of the career and how do we square the circle of supporting all stages versus maybe investment being optimised at certain stages of a career? Yeah. I mean, look, it's something we, we think about a lot and, and what, we, what we're trying to do, I suppose, is have a suite of programmes that, that do address that full career stage. Uh, so we were delighted a couple of years ago to, to set up the Pathways programme, uh, which we run in collaboration with the Irish Research Council, which has actually been, been, been great to work together on that programme and, and there's been a lot of learnings already doing that. I mean, we, we have very strong applications to that programme, a really strong flow of people coming into the system. And I, and I think that's actually a bit that we understand a bit better. Mm. In some ways, that makes sense. Mm. We know there's a lot of really strong postdoctoral researchers out there. Uh, obviously, you have your own selection processes, and we see very strong candidates. We, we still don't fund uh, you know, everybody that we can fund. We do run out of money, but we do get to reasonably good success rates in that programme. And I think we're, we're, you know, we're at least at international norms there. Mm. We then kind of have the, the Frontiers programme, and in a way, that's obviously set up to serve really everybody else mm. in terms of the individual-led piece from us. We've structured it so that if you're an early career researcher, 
uh, you, can, you can elect to be assessed as an early career researcher, which means that we will put more emphasis in the review process on your research proposal and your idea. And we did a lot of work in developing that and looking at other funding calls globally. And really, you know, we found if we didn't do that, it was impossible for those with a shorter track record of research to compete against those who had much longer track records of research. But again, in what we see coming through, we see very good balance. So we actually see quite a good balance in terms of emerging investigators being funded in that programme and more established researchers with, with longer careers uh, behind them. We actually see good balance in terms of gender. So, um, you know, working with Marion and, and her team, we've implemented a number of measures to try and tip the playing field that we know from data is not always level. Um, so, so actually, in terms of what comes through, you know, we are seeing quite a good range. And in that program, as I said, it was a 28% success rate. Thankfully, we were just able to put some more funding into the reserve lists, that there's still some that we haven't funded. But again, I'd say we're at kind of international norms. Okay. The, the awards where we're really, uh, my, 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 my sense is people are sort of self-selecting. I think there's probably capacity issues across the system mm. in terms of people finding the time to come into something. There isn't a deadline, so I suppose mm. it's always there, mm. and maybe that drives some of the behaviour, mm. but, but we're interested in finding mm. out more. Yeah, great, and we're happy to work together on that. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I'm going to move on to you, Siobhan, now. There's a, a nice question there from Lisa Keating, and I think it captures, I suppose, a lot of, you mentioned earlier, the discussion in the system, and very much about, you know, given that there'll be a new agency in 2024, how will the new research centre call, that could potentially, I suspect, will be tying up substantial multi-annual budget, how will that, you know, tally with that new agency remit and how that, that, that's yet to be drafted and that may or may not have the same relationship with prioritisation. So how is all that going to be squared? So I guess first of all to say we're always looking ahead even though we're, I guess, strongly instructed it's business as usual for the moment. We're very conscious of the fact that this is a multi-annual commitment that will flow into the future, into the new organisation. But if I come back to the, the comment I made about the wider focus of the, the new programme will be, whereas I guess when the programme first started, we were in the middle of an economic crisis. It was very strongly focused on delivering economic impact to Ireland. We now have an opportunity to widen that focus. And I know that the centres themselves have talked about all the great work that they do in terms of working with different societal partnerships. And that, that is a really integral part of centres as well and kind of the environmental impact that can come from centres. So now in the context of the new agency and that wider interdisciplinarity, <laughs> wider partnership focus, we're building that into the programme now so that it will be set up into the, the future and aligned with the, the new organisation. In the context of prioritisation, I guess right now research prioritisation does exist mm -hmm. and it will exist into next year and we're having discussions with the department about how that might change into the future to make sure that there is nothing within the programme that would conflict with the, the future plan. Yeah, that, that, Marley, can I chip in yeah, on that one can. as well? I think it's yeah. an important point as well about the amalgamation. You know, we can't get into a limbo state either. <clears throat> so it would be really bad for, for the entire community if we found ourselves saying, well, let's just wait until we see what happens. We wait and we wait. And, you know, these things can take time sometimes. Um, I've seen it before where, you know, there's an amalgamation date or a merger date set and it slips and it slips. And there's nothing worse than looking back and saying, you know, after two or three years, if it did, all right, and saying, God, I wish we'd gotten on with some of these things. So, you know, the, the instruction we've been given is we really need to keep pushing forward with all the intents and objectives of both agencies to continue to do that business as usual and continue to do the progress of things that we would naturally do. Thanks, Kiron. And just to circle back, that balance them between the breadth and depth. So, you know, people are obviously trying to conceptualise the future and notwithstanding, I, I, that, that's a valid point about the need to move forward. And it's important to hear about the connectivity with the ongoing prioritisation work and the new work. But what is, what, what I suppose assurance or, or, or what can you talk to about how the balance will be kept in this new centre landscape um, with new entrants in the five prioritisation areas and ensuring that there's depth and, and specialisation and research excellence to the fore, uh, while also ensuring that you haven't got maybe imbalance in the system across those five areas. Can you speak a little bit about that, Siobhan, as to what, what, what that might look like? Yeah, so I, I guess firstly it's to build on where, recognising where we have strengths as a country. So when we talk about five areas, some areas may have greater uh, capacity in terms of research uh, scale in Ireland at the moment. 
So it's really to kind of recognize where we have strengths and, and build on the successes that we have delivered to date. So as I said earlier, the program has always been aligned with prioritization. The reason we're trying to simplify it is we've gotten a very strong message from a number of external stakeholders that the system is very complicated and for people coming into Ireland and looking at the centre system, it seems like there's way too many centres for a, a country of our scale. We have looked internationally to see, is this a, a fair judgement? And it, it, I guess it has borne through to a degree. We always look internationally at what best practice is when we're redesigning programmes. So that has been kind of the, the first layer in terms of looking at this new programme. And the research prioritisation areas, the five broad areas, seemed like a good approach to maintain the consistency with the previous program. As, the pro as I said, when there was previously 14 areas, all of the centres had to demonstrate an alignment, primary alignment, secondary alignment to the different areas. So we're using that as a broad structure to show a simplified system to the external world. But within that, it doesn't mean that one centre bid that comes in has to cover the full breadth of that area because those areas are mm. incredibly broad. Mm. And a review panel mm. will kind of say, how can you be absolutely world leading in all of these areas. So that's where I guess we're, we're saying, look at where you're doing really strong as a, a system, whether you be a group that hasn't been a center to date or whether you're currently a center, build on those strengths and see where can you make a really compelling proposition who is best to work together to deliver on this? And the alignment then is really, we're saying, okay, under food science, we fit primarily under this. It doesn't mean there can't be collaboration across different areas. We're not trying to shoehorn centers into, you can only work in this one area. That's kind of a primary structure to try to simplify the system. Yeah, that's very helpful, Siobhan. I know you're having follow-up workshops on this, so yeah. we might leave more questions on that till those conscious of time. Kiran, I might come back to you um, with the question there from Kevin O'Connor, the first one. Um, and government have failed to reach the 2.5% target over, for over 15 years. What in the document, the national document, convinces you, Kiran, that this target will be achieved? And what can SFI do to see that this target is achieved? So in terms of what's in the document that convinces me it'll be achieved, nothing. Um, so let's, we, we can't be naive about it, because um, we saw that it was in a previous document and a target for 2020 to achieve it, and now it's a target for 2030. So you know, the, the non-naive way of looking at this is, you know, over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to walk a little bit in the shoes of politicians, and it's a tough role. Right? There are competing interests. We have a climate crisis, we have a housing crisis, and a health crisis, and a cost of living crisis. There are all these competing interests out there. Um, and they're a challenge for us because we're then sort of, you know, competing in that environment trying to say, well, me too. Um, you know, what about research? What about us? And how do we engage that? And the reality is as follows. We need to have a collective strong voice that sort of talks about the importance. That's why we do things like creating our future. That's why engaging with the public and the political system and departments is so important. A strong collective voice that continuously and collectively makes that case for why investment and in research is important. And that's one half of the journey. And then the other half of the journey is we're just going to have to go hunting. Mm. And we're going to have to recognize a little bit of, you know, what you kill, you eat. And we're going to go after new programs, new initiatives. And we're going to go after programs in Europe, going after programs with philanthropy. Um, there's funding out there. Mm. Um, there's funding for, actually, it's easy to get the shiny new programs, as they're often called. You can get those new programs. They're available. And I think, you know, with the programs we've already got and the money that, you know, Siobhan and Abigail both talked about, you know, that's great. What worries us is getting money for the core programs, you know, that basic research we're going to do in the Frontiers programs and Pathway and stuff, that's really, really hard. So the message I would have out there is anything you guys can do to engage with the system, engage with your politicians, engage in this process, um, because that's how you shape and influence it. Um, thanks, Kieran. And, and I think that picks up a lot on Andrew Bowie's question mm. about how do we, how does SFI going to help with ensuring specific, distinct um, opportunities for disciplines um, within STEM and AHSS. So I think we, we can consider that one captured. Um, there's a lot of discussion at the moment um, at the EU level about QARA and reforming research assessment. Um, has SFI thought about signing up to that EU agreement? Um, what's your sense as our countdown timer flashes at us. Mm. <coughs> I mean, so, so we, haven't, we haven't formally considered that agreement yet, but we are constantly looking mm. at our research mm. assessment. We have been part of EU programs coming in, assessing our mm. research assessment. Mm. Um, so it's sort of an ongoing process. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's something yeah. we, we yeah, will yeah, come yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're actually on. due to consider it shortly in terms yeah. of the implications from resource intensity yeah. or whatever, but as, as Ruth says, there are a lot of the elements of it that we are already well, doing, yeah. but it, it just drags it all together, but also as well, it, it, it kind of ups the resource intensity a bit in terms of 
been accountable back to the EU. So that's what we have to consider. You know, so. Okay. No, I think we'll have to close. There is a specific question I think that can be captured in a one-to-one -one conversation about infrastructure. Um, but can I thank the panel at this point? Um, I think it's, you know, obviously there's lots to be discussed in more detail, but it's very good to get the opportunity of that kind of high-level overview. And I think the summary message is that working together across all of this in the system, we can make the overall system better. And um, we very much welcome that opportunity. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Molly. Thank